Hey, everyone, and welcome to TAF Talks. We are looking at the status index of American attitudes toward Asian Americans, and this is such an important report. My name is Michelle Lee. I'm going to be the moderator of this stellar panel today. Um, I'm a journalist based in St. Louis, have been a journalist for 20 years, and I'm also the co-founder of the Very Asian Foundation, which has been such an exciting part of my 2022. So I hope we have you know, a robust conversation, we bring awareness to a really important subject and also leave people with bright spots as well. Um, if you wouldn't mind just going around and introducing yourself because you are all rock stars and I don't wanna get anything wrong, um, but you're all professors and wonderful people. So if you wouldn't mind, can we just introduce ourselves? My name is Paul Watanabe. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And I had the distinct pleasure of being the chair of this of a board of academic advisors for this project, really a blue ribbon group. And I want to welcome Erica and Russell and Jennifer as a representative of this larger group of individuals who helped us on this project. I'll go next. Uh, my name is Erica Lee, and I teach history and Asian American studies at the University of Minnesota. I also direct the Immigration History Research Center here, and I'm president of the Organization of American Historians. I'm so glad to be part of this conversation. Hi, everyone. I'm Professor Russell Jung from San Francisco State's Asian American Studies Program. Um, I'm also co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate, and I'd like to thank Michelle and the Asian American Foundation for this great event. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm a sociologist at Columbia University and also a senior researcher at AAPI Data. I am thrilled to be part of this project and part of this conversation with, as Paul Patnabe said, uh, a blue ribbon group of scholars and researchers who are really committed to advancing narratives with data about Asian American experiences and histories especially in the wake of COVID-19. Remember, we're rock stars, according to Michelle. It's true. You are totally rock stars. It is intimidating to be on this panel with you because you are really, truly the best of the best. So I appreciate your time. Before we delve into, you know, before we get into the weeds here, I do want to ask just a basic question. What did you think was surprising about the status index? For me, I think it's always really interesting to see this, um, you know, this stat that when asked to name a prominent Asian American, most people can't do it. Or they name uh, Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, or Lucy Liu. I mean, to me, that is just incredible. Um, but I'm wondering what stuck out to you. I'm going to follow up on that, Michelle, because I think one of the things that stuck out with me is that not only have that the majority of Americans cannot name a single Asian American, a single prominent Asian American, given that Kamala Harris is our vice president who is Asian American, but that also 42% of Americans cannot think of a single policy or historical event related to Asian Americans. And one of these things, those both of those statistics underscore is that Asian Americans are absent from the imagination of most Americans. And it's easy to point the blame on particular Americans. But when I saw those results, one of the things I thought about is, had I not learned about Asian American history, Asian American experiences on my own, would I have done better on, on those kinds of challenges? And what I realized is that something that actually Erica Lee has has been very vocal about, that Asian American history is not taught in our curricula. So if we are not presenting Asian American history and narratives in our curricula, can we really be surprised that most Americans cannot name a single prominent Asian American? Most Asian Americans cannot think of particular policies or histories related to Asian Americans. Right, exactly, Jennifer. And you know what I was even thinking is some people don't even know someone is a prominent Asian American. You know, like I think of like, how, how do people not know Bruno Mars? <laughs> you know, or like, <laughs> they just don't think about people who are Asian American. Um, what about everyone else in the group? What was another thing that surprised you about the status index? Um, let me just follow up on the, on the history question. And um, on the one hand, of course, the, the uh, results are, just horribly depressing, 
of Americans cannot name a, an Asian American um, example or person or significant event from American history. At the same time, the, the statistics are incredibly revealing as well, because when you dive deep into the data and we have asked respondents, we've given them a little bit of nudge uh, in terms of, you know, well, what about this event or what about this? When prompted, the respondents have identified historical events that are part of Asian history, not American history, that are predominantly related to US Asian wars, and that um, for the majority also focus on culture, you know, so cultural events like Chinese New Year, et cetera as part of Asian American history. So what this means is that we are doing such an incredibly poor job at teaching the totality of American history uh, and that Asian Americans continue to be seen as Asian, as part of Asia, as part of Asian history rather than American history. And this has really dire consequences that I'm sure we'll get to talk about um, in the later conversation. But these statistics are, are just, um, they compound what many of us who teach for a living already see in our classrooms. And it's really quite troubling. Well, perhaps a slightly disappointing part of that, however, is that Asian Americans themselves have the same difficulty in naming a prominent Asian American or prominent something. This is their, their specifically their history of their people here in the United States, and they themselves have difficulty in doing so. And let me just give you a perspective on this. I wasn't surprised, in fact, at the lack of information. It's because for about 45 years, I've been attempting to try to educate people about this. And frankly, I think I've fallen on deaf ears. And that's why with the events the last few years, I do hope that this renewed interest, and I hope that this, it, it, there is reflected some interest in, in looking at the Asian American experience, is, is an opportunity now that will take hold, that people will show this interest and this desire to learn this information, finally, about the rich history and the disturbing history in some respects of Asian Americans in the United States. And that's why this is an important opportunity for us to have conversations like this and the launch surveys will be a way in, in promoting those discussions as well into the future. And so it's, it should be an opportunity that I hope we don't miss uh, to, to have this conversation finally in the United States. We'll talk about policy um, solutions, I think, later on. But I think what Jennifer and Erica talked about, the, the omission of Asian Americans in our history, in our curricula, um, the confusions that others have about Asians and Asian Americans um, speak to Again, the overall ignorance and the invisibility of Asian Americans. So that wasn't surprising to me. But what was, but the impact was really surprising to me. One of the key findings from the launch survey was that um, of all racial groups, Asian Americans feel the least accepted in the U.S., have the least sense of belonging. And so 71% of us feel like we don't completely belong or feel are accepted. So the omission and lack of presence in education and, and media, plus what Paul referred to the scourge of racism during COVID-19, have really led Asian Americans to feel excluded, marginalized, unaccepted. And, you know, we at Stop the API Hate found that um, one out of five Asian Americans experienced racism in the past year. The launch survey said 71% of Asian Americans face discriminations or experience it themselves. So um, a key finding that I found was that the omission and invisibility of Asian Americans, along with the racism oriented against Asians, has really led us to feel marginalized, to feel excluded. And um, for younger people, they feel even less acceptance. And so that's been a historic experience of Asian Americans to be considered perpetual foreigners, to be seen as a yellow peril threat. And it's just been exacerbated during COVID-19, this feeling of exclusion. I think um, the others will agree, you know, um, a history of violent exclusion has really been one of the key themes of our Asian American experience. 
exclusion and also erasure. I mean, this all kind of ties together. And when we're looking at numbers, I think the number from the status index was like 19% of Asian Americans felt like they belong. That is so low and incredible to me. Um, and even when we talk about um, kind of like these dual existences of being invisible and hyper visible during the pandemic, I mean, people really had two experiences um, over the last couple of years. Um, I think that this has really impacted youth. I mean, we've talked about mental health awareness among youth. Um, the CDC just came out and said, hey, uh, suicide is the number one cause of death in Asian American youth. It's the only time that it's the number one cause of death. So we have seen it impact our young people and Asian Americans in general. So I do wanna ask you, you know, what do you believe are the root causes of the severe lack of belonging among AAPI youth in particular, and what can be done to address these issues? And I really think this is a good question for Jennifer because I know you've done extensive research, but um, feel free anyone to chime in. Well, that is a very loaded question. And I think um, I'm just really glad that we're opening up the dialogue and speaking about all of this because uh, oftentimes the depiction of Asian American youth experiences focuses on um, how well they're doing in school, their exceptional academic outcomes, and often they're weaponized as tools to dismantle race conscious affirmative action, which is happening now. Rarely, do we hear other experiences about feeling like Asian American youth don't belong? And to underscore what you said, Michelle, actually Asian American youth are the least likely group to feel like they belong. And they're less likely to feel like they belong than even Asian immigrants. So US born Asians are less likely to feel like they belong in the United States than Asian immigrants and Asian American youth are the least likely. And in part, for me, that makes sense because US born Asians are not looking at Asian immigrants as the reference group of how they how they feel like they should belong. They're looking at their non-Asian American peers who are not asked, where are you from? Go back to your country. They're not, they haven't been spit on during the pandemic. They've not been mocked. Um, they've not been told to go back to your country. So these experiences that um, many in our data, Russell mentioned one in five Asian Americans have experienced some kind of anti-Asian hate incident, which is very similar to our data at API data, which is shows that about one in six have experienced some kind of anti-Asian hate incident since the start of the pandemic. So much so that um, over one in three of us worry often or all the time about being victimized because of our race. More than one in three have changed our routines so that we are not victimized. Um, so these constant experiences of not feeling like we belong are actually manifested in everyday experiences that we have, um, we're, we're dealing with in our everyday lives. One of the things I also wanted to point out from the status index that was really alarming for me was that things have gotten worse. They have not gotten better since the start of the pandemic. So more Americans are more likely to blame Asian Americans for COVID-19 than they were in 2021. More Americans believe that reference to the COVID-19 as the China virus or Wuhan virus are acceptable. And more Americans actually question the loyalty of Asian Americans, underscoring um, many of the comments that my uh, co-panelists co have said about this feeling that we don't belong. It's not in our imagination. This is very much coming through through data that is brought to bear by the status index. Can I just follow up on that, Jennifer? Because I want I want to know, you said one in three people worry about being victimized or one in three people have changed their routines. And I'm just wondering in this panel, how many people have either worried or changed their routine? Oh my goodness, I've, I've worried. I, I've, I've never worried about my safety almost to the point where I feel like I've been cavalier about my safety. 
Um, since the pandemic, I have completely changed my routine. I will not go um, grocery shopping, for instance, on my own. I think about what I'm signaling when I wear a mask, even though I'm trying to protect others, because I understand um, that images of Asians wearing masks have been deployed by the media to signal COVID-19. I've become hyper aware yet at the same time feel privileged that um, I can create safe routines for myself, unlike many um, less affluent, less privileged, more disadvantaged Asians who do not have that option. So I'm, on, I'm not thinking just about myself, of course, I'm thinking about our, the diversity of our Asian American communities who don't have certain kinds of options that many of us do. And it should be pointed out, these sorts of signs of fear and so forth are not the kind of thing that Russell would point out, show up in, in government crime statistics. These are not hate crimes, the responses in terms of fear and trauma and so forth, but they're very prevalent. Uh, recently in the city of Boston, the, the, the head of the city council and the mayor had a listening session in the, in the Chinese American community, the Chinatown community. And about 100 people shown up to this listening session just to talk about their experiences under COVID-19. And it was interesting to me that one of the guys that got up, an 81-year-old gentleman, got up and he said, he and his wife, they're both American citizens. They're naturalized citizens. They're, they become citizens. Uh, they're immigrants who become citizens of the United States. But yet he had heard somewhere that if they that the United States government is rounding up immigrants and sending them back to China, so he and his wife sent, simply hid out, if you will, for 31 days in their apartment and didn't dare leave their apartment because they heard this misinformation. This sort of thing is the kind of trauma that we're seeing, and and cases of individuals getting beat up over the head or something like that, or yelled at, and so forth. These are the much more typical ways, but these ways in which individuals are are they're fearful of being bullied. For example, cases when we went back from having a, a an environment in which we taught school, uh, school uh, remotely and went back to in-person in the Boston schools, for example, one of the groups that did not want to go back to school in-person was Asian American families. And the reason was they didn't want to go back and be, face the possibility of bullying and so forth. These are real ways in which the community is being impacted by these things. And Russell has some wonderful data about the extent to which the fear of, of, of COVID-19 is the number one fear that Asian Americans have expressed. And maybe Russell can tell us about that, Dave. Sure, Paul. It is really scary. I'm saying this is a period of collective racial trauma. So if, if Jennifer's numbers or our numbers are correct, that's one out of six, one out of five Asian Americans. That's three to four million cases of hate recently. And those of us who experience racism, and one out of five of us experience trauma responses, the avoidance, the fear, the hypervigilance that we've all been talking about. So here's um, my startling takeaway fact um, or data point. When asked, what's your greatest fear during the pandemic? Asian Americans who experience racism, they overwhelmingly say they fear other Americans hate. They are more afraid of other Americans than the pandemic that's killed over a million people. That's what's so striking is that we're hypervigilant as a community. We're traumatized as a community, but not by the pandemic, but by racism. And so um, Erica could talk to you. This is going to have historic impacts. This is going to have um, intergenerational impacts unless we um, deal with it now and unless with the status index and its recommendations get um, implemented, um, we need to address the trauma. We need to stop the, the, the racism, the institutionalized forms of it, um, because it will have long time, long term impacts. Erica, do you want to add something to that? I would love to, I, um, simply because I firmly believe, and I think the data shows that what we've seen in the past few years amidst this. This I was going to say historic rise in anti Asian hate, and on the one hand, it is historic in in terms of its um, breadth and scope. But as a historian, I have to say that we've experienced these as Asian Americans experience these. Um, they're not episodes; they are long histories, deep rooted histories of systemic uh, 
racism and hate and violence targeting Asian Americans. But what the lack of historical knowledge, the lack, and not just historical knowledge, but just awareness of this history has been um, for our communities and for the larger American community is that I fear that all of us um, were unprepared, unprepared to to understand, to respond to, to reckon with, and to take seriously what was happening um, and what continues to happen within our communities. For too long, uh, episodes of of anti-Asian racism and hate have been uh, characterized as episodic, as uh, exceptional, as something that's happened randomly, very unfortunate, but definitely not part of larger patterns um, of systemic racism. And, and thus they've been dismissed. And when we don't take seriously both the history as well as the contemporary reality of racism, then the next generation um, suffers and the pattern of invisibility continues for not just Asian Americans, but for so many uh, communities that we know have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Well, that was, I mean, that- Can I just follow up? Oh, yeah. I wanted to just follow up on something Erica said. And uh, again, it, it's also related to the status index. What's also alarming is that one third of Americans report that they're unaware of the rise in anti-Asian racism. There, I mean- what Paul, Russell, Erica, what all of us have underscored is, is the collective trauma that we have been experiencing for two years. Asian Americans have been living in a period of mourning, anger, fear, and exhaustion for over two years since the wake of the pandemic, yet one third of Americans are completely unaware of this, that to me was also startling and underscores what Erica says about incidents being perceived as episodic, as reduced to just the mental illness of the assailant, not really trying to think about how these kind of hate crimes and hate incidents are, are um, not only a contemporary phenomenon, but part of our history. Um, so this, this, I think that it gets back to how you started, Michelle, this idea that 58% of Americans can't even name an Asian American and 42% can't think of a particular historical event. Asian Americans are absent from the imagination of Americans, and they're so absent that they're not, that they're oblivious to the surge in anti-Asian hate and racism that had, that has really kind of swept all of us um, for over two years. Yeah, I just wanna echo what um, Jennifer just said about, um, again, the ignorance of the broader community, that the racism we've been experiencing has been historic and it's embedded in our institutions. They're not just a few ignorant, prejudiced people, it's because our institutions, like our public school system, our institutions like the media um, fail to include our narratives. It's because um, our policies actually see us as threats. That's why they cut refugee resettlement. That's why they cut H-1B visas. And so the racism we're experiencing, this historic period, isn't new. It's historicized, but it's also institutionalized. And I think that's something that we all agree on. That it's, This is a structural issue that our educational system has failed us so that people are ignorant. Our media and our political systems have failed us so that people um, hyper fetishize Asian American women, for example. And so um, we really want to get at the roots of the racism rather than just blaming a few ignorant, prejudiced individuals. I want to follow up with that, Russell, and I'm glad you brought up just the structural and the institutional changes that should be happening, because I will say, even as a member of the media, um, it is hard or has been hard for Asian Americans to make progress within just the traditional media industry, whether it's television or print or whatever. But I mean, back in the day, people used to tell me, Michelle, we can't hire you 
because we already have an Asian person here. So if we have two, that will confuse the viewer. I mean, I've literally had people say, that will confuse the viewer. And it's never an Asian person who's telling me that because I've never had an Asian hiring manager. So it's this idea. So it's, you know, frankly, even like when we look at like meal sit market ratings or whatever, you know, they look at households. There's um, like a black Nielsen uh, uh, meter as well. But when you talk about like, well, what other metrics are being uh, being grabbed, you know, and, and looked at? Well, there aren't enough Asian Americans to uh, to look at this metric in this city. What is that? No, that's not true at all. When we're looking at how uh, we are the fastest growing, we make up the world's population, uh, we have the most disposable income. There's so many other metrics that are worth looking at. And in my particular school district in the Midwest, we have like 17% Asian American students, which was more than my district in Seattle. So I always feel like there is this misnomer of like, it's just, it's just totally false, a false narrative on what well, who we are and where we are, you know, um, being from the Midwest, I guess I should say, it just angers me because there is some gatekeeping that has been going on and under indexing for many, many years. And until we can get people to make decisions to make that switch, I mean, if you can't even see an Asian American in your own backyard being represented, then how do you, where do you think they are? You know, like how, what is your perception of Asian Americans if you don't even see them in your community? at a basic level. So I could go on and on, but I think that this segues into how can we work to shift two things, but let's just start with the this the public question. So how can we work to shift the general public's attitude toward Asian Americans? And Russell, maybe you wanna start that. Well, first of all, I wanna say, you know, the, the racism that we're experiencing isn't an Asian American issue. It's clearly other people's issue towards us. And so, they need to take it on as their issue and become responsible about educating themselves, becoming aware of their own implicit biases, uh, becoming more alert to the changing demographics of our nation. So, um, again, I think public education is the first and probably the most widespread way to give people a better understanding of the Asian American and Pacific Islander experience. If we could. Um, and yeah. can I point out, Russell, to their credit, this uh, population that we've given a bit of a notion that they're uninformed and they're somewhat clueless, they themselves are able to say that they thought the number one way to address the ignorance was through education and greater information. They had that insight themselves, and I give them credit for making that particular argument. Yeah, so everybody agrees that education is probably the best approach to dealing with racism, so if we can further the efforts to require Asian American narratives in our school, I think that would go a long way. Um, if, and that would really help Asian American kids who are being bullied in the classroom if they're you know, presented in the curriculum, seen as being significant parts of American history and American literature and American issues. So for me, education is probably the best way, but I'm sure others could talk about other ways that we could heighten awareness of our communities. Can I extend a little bit Russell's argument? And that is that there is another finding that I thought was also a very positive one in this in terms of the insightfulness of our of our public. And that is the extent to which the public saw themselves. These are principally the non-white people of color saw Asian Americans as fellow people of color. And that's an important understanding to ha ha have because it helps to answer the question. We say education and information. What is their education and information about what? Well, one of them obviously is the Asian American experience. But number two is you cannot just look at the Asian American experience in isolation. You've got to look at the whole totality of the notion of race and the, and the fundamental notion of race and how it's taught in it and, and how it's a fundamental part of the history of the United States. And therefore, the fact that Asian Americans, like other people of color, have been dealt with some respects differently, some respects the same, but you cannot understand the Asian American experience without looking critically at the role of race, the continuing role of race in the United States from its beginnings right to the current period of time. And so the understanding that the way to help understand the Asian American experience is not to look at it in isolation only, but to look at it in terms of the larger project of looking at race in the United States is critical. And on top of that, you got to extend that discussion to look at issues of capitalism and imperialism and so forth and all those aspects are the, one that, the, the ways in which you understand the Asian American experience as a people of color within the United States. 
And that is, I think, a suggestion to some extent about when we say what the people have to know, they, they have to know, I suppose, who Asian Americans are and what their policies are, but even more so, they have to know the larger critical, critically analyze the larger dynamic of race within the country and the role that Asian Asian Americans have played with other people of color in terms of this dynamic. That I think is critical. We want to follow up uh, with that as well, because when we look at states like New Jersey and Illinois, um, we know that they have passed mandatory API history courses or curriculum. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do you make that a bigger movement? We've seen so many um, really cantankerous school board meetings with critical race theory or book bans. Um, and then there's also the issue of like some people don't want, some states will not pass just Asian American history. They want equity in education. So I'm wondering what does it look like to you to make that movement bigger? I'll take a stab at answering that first. Um, first of all, the that context that you just raised, Michelle, about how on the one hand, we have these wonderful efforts, incredibly important efforts to require Asian American history in two states happening. On the other hand, we have a war, an all out war that's being waged against American history, period. And that means the, the struggles, the challenges to including readings about slavery, about segregation, about the Jim Crow era. I, Asian American history books or books that relate to Asian American history have not been at the, the front lines of these um, efforts until recently. Uh, so uh, two weeks ago, a month ago, a school board in Wisconsin um, decided to ban a book focusing on Japanese American incarceration. Um, we have to see, as everyone has been saying here, we have to see what has been happening to Asian Americans, including uh, the war over American history, as inextricably related to the backlash to civil rights, the backlash to progressive move movements in general. And so, you know, while we need to support and to um, move forward other local and state efforts to require Asian American history. It's just the first uh, starting point. I've had the privilege of talking with some of the youth activists who were involved and helped to push forward the effort in New Jersey, um, part of the Make Us Visible group. And they said, yes, this is a phenomenal victory. But what we're really concerned about right now is who's going to write that curriculum and what is that curriculum going to include? And so we can't just rest. We can't just say, check, you know, this, this thing has been done in these two places and it'll eventually, you know, go on to other states. We have to be ever vigilant to not only keep pushing, but also to be involved in the curriculum planning and to make sure that Asian American history does not get whitewashed in this larger challenge over CRT. There is, uh, there can be the um, impulse to just focus on inclusion, just to focus on the celebratory narratives that's not going to serve us well in the long run. We can't just be token placeholders or tokens, um, success stories. We have to be part of the larger narrative about systemic racism, how it intersects with settler colonialism, how it intersects with um, racial discrimination, but also how Asian Americans have worked alongside with built upon the civil rights victories, the um, social justice movements um, across across so many communities. That has to be part of the, the picture as well. So on the one hand, our work is really just beginning and it's a multi-fronted, um, it's a multi-fronted battle, just as the other side is highly funded and well-organized and very passionate we also have to bring those resources, that passion, that commitment and time 
to to our battle front as well. I hate to use these war metaphors, but really um, these are pretty striking and, and dire times. Yeah, I think Erica's really on point. Um, the anti-CRT movement is passing legislation. I recently heard like over 40 states now have passed or proposed anti-CRT legislation bans on books, bans on concepts. But um, at the same time, you know, Michelle, Asian Americans across the nation have been proposing Asian American curriculum. There's actually 17 states that have passed or um, proposed um, that Asian American narratives be required. So that's a broad movement as well. Um, people don't realize that across the nation, grassroots Asian American and Pacific Islander groups are rallying, are lobbying, are advocating to have our narratives included. So I think that's one of the remarkable trends. And that's what the Status Index recommends, is that not only do we institutionalize um, AAPI narratives, but then that we develop the curriculum, that we train the teachers, because you could require it for the top, but if it's not taught well, then you know they could teach anything or they may teach misinformation. So I think um, to build this movement for Asian American studies at the K through 12 level, we have to do what Paul and Erica are, are suggesting is to um, not only require it, but make sure it's taught well, that they have the proper analyses, that we include race and intersectional and transnational themes, that we look at multiracial solidarity rather than just talking about our contributions, right? And so um, I think all of us here teach Asian American studies in that way. And we want to make sure that it gets um, implemented, but implemented well. It's a really good point. Um, it's just, I want to say something just um, when you were talking about Wisconsin, Erica, I was in Wisconsin for a very Asian week in Madison just after that ban happened. And then I'm actually going to go to New Jersey on behalf of the Very Asian Foundation to do a fundraiser for curriculum uh, for New Jersey teachers. And so I feel like uh, and then me covering as a journalist, um, Illinois, because we cover like East St. Louis, which is in Illinois and other places in Illinois as well. Um, you know, a lot of teachers are saying, okay, what are we teaching? What are we going to teach? Mm -hmm. So um, even though, yes, the, Illinois was the first state to pass mandatory curriculum, what are the teachers going to teach? And this is coming up really mm -hmm. soon. So do you have any suggestions on what they should be teaching students? <laughs> maybe well, it's a, maybe it's too hard of a question to answer you know well I, one thing i really worry about is these mandates without the proper training that people are actually going to do the teaching there are not a lot of people who really understand this history well and understand the proper uh, context and the proper parameters the proper frames to put this discussion and i really worry about you know, Russell talks about narratives and narratives are, are really where it's all at. You can have narratives that are truthful and careful and wise and, and narratives that really hide reality. And given the environment that Eric is talking about, I can see a lot of people want to propose teaching this stuff, but using narratives that are really questionable in terms of their outcome. The notion that Asian Americans have proven to be the successful minority, going back to the model minority narratives of the 1960s, for example. I really worry about those concepts because the really the, put, the 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 proof in the pudding is in the narratives and what is said in those narratives. And I think that given the 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 general lack of knowledge about these things, I really worry about we're going to have a lot of mandates to teach and not a, not not a, a careful conception about who teaches and what they're teaching. Not in terms of the facts and so forth, but in terms of the context in which that, that those facts are to be understood properly. I worry about the narratives that go forward, that they're not going to be the ones that, because I think that the field of Asian American studies is one that's really been a response to traditional narratives that existed before the field became developed. And it's really a response to very traditional narratives. And, and that fight has been an ongoing one. And I think those narratives still have a lot of pull and a lot of power, particularly, again, as Erica points out, and this desire by certain sectors within the country to find those narratives that, that talk about not the problematic aspects of race, but about the fact that we have overcome a lot of those problems. And it's really uh, something that we need to, to talk about the, the wonderful things that happen in terms of race rather than the problematic aspects of it. Should we talk about where other groups are getting information about Asian Americans? 
I can talk just a little bit about that. I mean, I, I remember, um, it, you know, Asian Americans are getting information about Asian Americans from their families and their households. Other Americans are getting information from media, from news. And so, Michelle, this gets to your point about how important it is to have representation in media, that having two Asian American news anchors or journalists at an organization is perceived as too many. How ludicrous is that? As you mentioned, we are the fastest known group, um, yet we are sorely underrepresented in leadership, in entertainment, in a number of venues. And even when we are visible, for some reason, Americans aren't seeing ourselves, are, are, are recognizing the visibility as strongly. Um, one of the things that struck me a bit is thinking about um, thinking about representation. One of the things that came out also from the status index is that Americans would like to see more Asian Americans in movies, in entertainment, in media. And so this isn't something that we as Asian Americans just want for ourselves. Americans across racial groups want to see more diversity of representation, including Asian Americans. And this kind of gets back to, brings a lot of the points that have been um, stated by Erica, Russell, and Paul, the idea of narratives. Who controls the narratives of Asian Americans? We need to control our own narratives, that it doesn't serve us when someone someone else is actually creating false narratives or misinterpreting results and 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 um, making causal arguments. So let me just give you an example. One of the things I feel like I do, and I know Russell feels this too, as sociologists, we're often disrupting tropes about Asian Americans. So the perception that Asian Americans are all high achievers, that we are the model minority who are excelling in school. A lot of the what we see as strong educational outcomes are the result of the hyper-selectivity, what I call the hyper-selectivity of Asian immigration. So let me explain what that is. So if we look at Chinese immigrants in the United States, about 51% have a college degree or more, compared to only 4% in China, that means that US Chinese in the United States are 15 times more likely to have a college degree than Chinese who don't immigrate. It means that Chinese in the United States are highly selected in terms of high levels of education, what I call hyper-selected. They're more likely to be college educated than those who don't immigrate, and they're more likely to be college educated than the US mean. That if we don't understand the selectivity of immigration, of certain Asian immigration, then we lead, we believe that Asians are high achieving, are smart, are intrinsically smart. A lot of creating narratives is about looking at the data and correcting bias narratives of Asian Americans. And how do we do that? It's with data, it's with resources, it's with making sure that the people who want to craft correct narratives are in charge of those narratives. And so this is why I think the status index has done such a service. Um, We can't know about these things unless they're studied, unless these projects are funded. And COVID-19 what has what has what it has done? It's been disastrous, and as Russell said, more Amer- Asian Americans were worried about being victimized by racism than they were about being victimized by the virus. But what it has done is actually show that the deep vacuum that has been missing in understanding the Asian American population. I was just thinking of a million things when you were talking about that, because when I worked in Seattle, where the majority minority or whatever you want to call it is Asian, um, you know, 
there's always there was always kind of this misnomer about what that looked like, what Asian Americans look like in Seattle. But when you mm-hmm. talk to like the Asian Counseling and Referral Service in Seattle, which I volunteer for a lot, they said the majority of Asian Americans in Seattle were at or below the poverty line and were very tied to immigration. So um, I just find that fascinating that so many times our truth is not shared. We are not represented accurately. Um, and even like the uh, you know, some of the resources for like scholarships and things like that were not made available to Asian American youth because groups thought that, oh, Asian Americans don't need help, you know, so um, to me. More Asian Americans are in community colleges than in four-year colleges in the United States. That's just, just another misnomer. The, the assumption that most Asian Americans are at the Ivy League schools or at the high level schools, like even in the UC system, and that's not the case. They're principally, they're the largest number in community colleges and in non, uh, non-four-year non programs in the United States. Wow. Um, so let me ask you this. What is the one metric that should move policymakers to action? What would you say it would be? Well, I'll just start off by, um, as a sociologist, I really like data. And so it's with data that we can correct narratives, that we can actually move to action. And this is... Um, This is what we say at API data, it's DNA, data narratives in action. And so one of the things that if you look at the data about Asian American attainment, whether it's education, whether it's poverty, whether it's welfare receipt, whether it's health outcomes, on a number of indicators, what you see is a tremendous diversity in our community, that you have a number of Asian American groups living below the poverty level. You have many who are receiving welfare. You have many who are not even um, getting into community colleges. They're barely finishing high school. And so one of the things that I think is important about this um, that I hope is a takeaway is that we understand that the diversity of Asian Americans is tremendously broad, and the narratives cannot be skewed to look at just a slice of the Asian American experience. I'll I'll add a metric um, uh, related to narratives. In the current spate of racism against Asian Americans, the the key main narrative is that we're experiencing hate crimes. But our data shows, and other people's data shows, that what's happening is that more people are reporting um, microaggressions, daily harassment, um, verbal assaults, um, racialized, sexualized, homophobic um, verbal attacks. And so if if those incidents make up two-thirds of the racism we're experiencing, then and if that's the key metric, then the policy to address it would be how do we address the street harassment that Asians face, that women of color face, that LGBTQ face. So in California, that's what we're doing. Um, Stop API Hate is um, sponsoring three bills to address street harassment and to um, try to create norms of civility and respect um, to identify racism as a public health issue. So um, that's one key takeaway from our data is that hate crime enforcement isn't really going to solve this issue. We, again, have to get at the roots of racism. And one of it, the roots is the widespread harassment that we are facing at the moment. Um, yeah, and another, I could give another metric, but um, it's not necessarily a policy metric, but um, the, the status index found that most people get their information about Asians from news, not news, actually, from movies and TV. And so if that's where people gain their understanding, then they get an understanding of Asians that's stereotypic, that shows women as being hypersexualized, as men, as martial artists. And that's why you could, and that has a real clear impact, right? We're seen as perpetual foreigners, we're seen as exotic and weird, we're seen as fetishized. And that's why we have things like the Atlanta shootings, um, where the individual targeted. Asian women, apparently. So um, that doesn't, it's hard to develop policies for corporate practices, for media practices, but it's clear, like you said, Michelle, we need Asians at the table, um, in the newsrooms, and um, writing our own narratives, creating our own scripts so that we could tell our own stories, so that we're not seen as stereotypes, but as fully human. 
I think it was pretty clear within the Asian American journalist community how underrepresented uh, journalists were during the Atlanta shooting. And what that coverage ended up looking like was exactly what everyone thought it was going to be. And so, um, you know, it is time in many newsrooms to over index. Um, and we have yet to really see that play out as well. I do want to follow up, though, something. Um, is it problematic to show some of the brutality that we've seen, like, say, in San Francisco or New York? Um, is it problematic to show those when the real, like you said, numbers might be microaggressions or racism? It's not to say that those are not important. They're very important, right, um, to show the brutality and attacks on our community. But um, if we're trying to make some sort of community or culture change and get language access or get whatever we need, um, what do we need to do to kind of overcome some of the, the headlines that we continually see over and over again? Well, I agree with that. It's sort of the daily indignities of being a person of color in the United States that are really the important things. It's not the, the large scale violence that's, that's imposed on our communities and communities of color. I, I mean, all of it's important, but it's just sort of just the, the notion of living as a person of color in the United States and the desire for some refuge, some psychological refuge at times and some relief and some answers to that. And that's why to answer your previous question, what I found important in this survey was in fact the fact that many Asian Americans and many people of color in the United States saw themselves together in a project in the United States as working as people of color in the United States. And the fact is that that understanding is the first step towards something in terms of political activism or collective engagement in some particular respects. And this is as a country approaches the possibility when soon within about 20 years, the country will become a majority non-white country. And this assuredly is something that is leading to the counter response that we're seeing a daily here in the United States as part of the response of white nationalists and so forth. And the greatest fear I think they have is that basic understanding that these people of color will share this knowledge, share this understanding, and ally with themselves and other people, white people in the United States who understand the, the need for diversity and responding to this racial dynamic. That's the greatest concern of the white nationalists and people who are going to argue differently. And I see that as the great hope of the country is that we can build upon that understanding and that desire. And that's something that Asian Americans are going to have to see that they have a role to play as well. I don't think Asian Americans can claim that they have been at the leadership of these issues, but that they've been a part of it. And they're going to have to take on more of a leadership role in their understanding of this. And it's fighting not just for Asian American causes, but for people of causes Black lives do matter to Asian Americans and all lives should matter to Asian Americans when it involves people of color within the United States. And that's an understanding we have to take away from this. And Michelle, just on the question of representation, it was not that long ago when you talk about the journalists. I remember there was a study of young kids and the number one thing is that they watched television news, Asian American kids. And we thought, well, they'd be nerdy Asian American kids. And we found out the reason they did is that the, it was often as anchors on news programs that they only saw people like themselves as Asian Americans. So while you talk about the underrepresentation of Asian Americans, in some cases, they were about the only place where kids can see some representation on, on the television. And therefore, they were drawn to the fact of watching news because they saw people like themselves, like you and others before you on, on the news broadcast. So the extent to which we can improve that, that, that contributes as well to the, to the notion that you're talking about, about the value of representation in the media. Oh my gosh. Well, that is, a, that's really cool to hear. And I will say, yeah, it's so important to see people like you in your own community, you know? Yeah. And so that's great that people have that connection, that kids have that connection. And then I'll say even working on the West Coast, you, I, there was, there's no station on the West Coast where I was, I should say Pacific Northwest, um, where there were two Asians anchoring together, unless yeah. it was a fill-in. So if you don't even have that in yeah. Seattle, you know, how do you expect it in St. Louis or how do you expect it in Kansas City or Des Moines, Iowa? You know, we've got and we're still getting first. Like my friend, she knew her is the first Hmong American anchor in the country. You know, I mean, it's just like we still have a long way to go in terms of representation, but we need to see it in our backyard. We need to see it in Cheyenne, Wyoming. We need to see it in Butte, Montana. You know, the 210 television markets that we've got in this country. Um, so I guess my my next, I've got two questions and then I got to wrap up. Um, you know, 
when are we going to replace some of the the responses that we had? You know, the Jackie Chans, the Bruce Lees. When are we going to have someone take the next spot um, to be a prominent Asian American when we ask this question next time? I think it's coming. It's coming because one of the things that I've seen with this current and the upcoming, the rising generation of high school and college students is how politically active they are. Certainly it's been the pandemic and their own experiences of racism. You know, the statistics from Stop AAPI Hate show that it's the the elderly, the youth and women who are the most targeted. So absolutely these experiences have politicized um, our, the, our, our youth, the next generation, but it's also been climate change. It's also been George Floyd and, and multiple, the Me Too movement, multiple um, uh, social justice movements, and they see them as inextricably related. Uh, so again, you know, when I talk to, when I talk to those who are not just involved in, but leading movements, creating new organizations, creating new zines, doing podcasts, it's really inspirational. Um, not only do I wonder, like, how do you have the time to do all of that and, and go to school, but also because their worldview is so, um, is so complex. It is so um, advanced and just, you know, I, I'm going to say radical. You know, it, they are not content to sit on the sidelines. They're not content with business as usual. They're not content with seeing just the first in their communities. Uh, They want to make sure that they are working towards long-term change for their own opportunities and their futures, but also for the next generation. And so this, you know, all of these, the data points, the research that we do can be, they can be real downers. They really can. And especially as a historian who's been teaching Asian American history for a long time, I'm always so discouraged when my students continually say, I never knew this happened. But, um, but I think it's coming. And I know that there are so many leaders that have come to the forefront or who we have collectively shined a light on that we should have shined a light on, you know, a long time ago, um, that, that there's, there's more representation in all, uh, levels and all sectors of society, um, politics, education, sports, and it's, it's a great time. It's, it's, it's a very difficult time, but it's also a great time to be Asian American or to be very Asian, Michelle. Yeah. Michelle, I think it will happen when Russell and Erica and Jennifer joined by you as rock stars, cut your first debut album and it'll go to the top and it'll make you all famous and you'll be the most famous Asian American group in the country. I like it. Um, okay, so on that note, I mean, we so positive. What else? Everyone share, like, what else gives you hope? Yeah, I mean, let's just talk about what, what are you hopeful? Like, what, what gives, what makes you get up in the morning and gives you a great outlook for the day? Or what gives you hope for the future? You know, it's given me hope, despite all the trauma that I've been seeing and reading about, is to see Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders from all walks of life step up and resist the racism and to organize. So they're they're organizing in their classrooms, in their faith-based institutions, in their unions, in their corporate employee groups. And for Stop API Hate, we get volunteers from all over the place. You know, you don't think of data scientists being activists, but they are. We we have marketing executives. We have, um, you know, people who just want to bake and then donate their bake sales to stop API hate. So that's what gives me hope is to see our community really come together in solidarity across ethnicity, across age, and then work with allies across race. Um, and so I've, I've really seen this global movement arise. You know, okay, okay, here's another data point. BTS's tweet, stop API hate, was the most retweeted post in the world last year. So, um, it's the normal people, not necessarily BTS. It's the 
the average person doing what they can to make a change is what's given me hope. And so um, that's been pretty inspiring the past year. I think against the old Addies that don't be the nail that sticks out because you're going to likely get hammered. I think a lot of young people in particular are willing to be nails that stick out and, and suffer the consequences of being out there. And that gives me some hope about the future. I'm going to be a little bit geeky here and say that what gives me hope is apart from all the inspiring things that Erica and Russell and Paul said is that understanding that what is not studied cannot be understood. And so what has been giving me hope is that um, organizations like Stop API, API Data, TAF, Launch, um, that we have actually create, we have been given resources, we have garnered resources to produce more data about our communities, to create more multifaceted narratives about our communities. Um, so that in hopefully in 2023, when we ask about a prominent Asian American, the response is not Jackie Chan, who is not even American, or Bruce Lee, who has been dead for almost 50 years, that we can point to other prominent Asian Americans. And that is through research, that is through narratives, that is through action. And so that gives me hope that even though we have been living through a period of exhaustion and mourning and anger and fear, um, that through this all, we've actually come out working together, as Russell said, across racial groups, across genders, across um, age cohorts to create more accurate narratives about who our community is and that we are not just Asian American, but we are American. That very Asian is very American, as you say, Michelle. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's what you stole my line. <laughs> Yes, I mean, this conversation gives me so much hope. You know, I wasn't really sure how I was going to start because I thought, oh my gosh, this data is so heavy and, um, you know, it can be hard, hard conversations and hard data to look at. But this conversation gives me so much inspiration and hope. And thank you for doing all the work that you do. You are rock stars. You are amazing people. And I just really appreciate your time and talent. And also should thank everyone um, at TAF who put this together and want to thank everyone who is watching as well. Hope you read the status index of American attitudes toward Asian Americans and understand that we all have a place of belonging. Thank you. <laughs>